Hi, and welcome to Focal Point AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. Great to have you along for the ride today. Got some quick pieces of news and updates for you. Uh, you may have heard that a new pastor has been chosen to replace Louis Giglio for the inauguration. His name is Reverend Luis Leon. He's an Episcopal uh, priest, so that's going to be safe. Episcopal's gone over the dam on the whole issue of homosexual marriage long time ago, so President Obama won't have to worry about him espousing uh, any kind of defense of natural marriage and the natural family. Um, let's see, Americans United for Life have come out with an annual life list. They rank all the states in the union based on how sanctity of life friendly their record is defending and protecting the lives of their citizens. Number one state in the union is Louisiana. The worst state, the most pro-death state in the country is Washington. You'd think it'd be somewhere on the Northeast, but it's not. It's Washington uh, state. The most pro-life states are after Louisiana, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Arkansas, and Arizona. The most pro-death states after Washington are California, New York, Vermont, and New Jersey. And NARAL, which is the leading pro-death organization in the country, they are complaining that since 1995, states have enacted a total of 755 pro-life uh, measures. Now, uh, We've talked about uh, the fact that Mississippi uh, may soon become the first state in the union to have no abortion clinics whatsoever. There's only one that is surviving in, in Mississippi right now, and right now, technically, it is in violation of the law. And right now, it's simply a matter of procedure in order to shut this place down, assuming some judge doesn't step in and tyrannically uh, impose some kind of stay on closing uh, this thing down, but Republican Governor Phil Bryant of Mississippi, strongly pro-life, his goal, and this is this is this is what great. We have a governor that is so pro-life. He says my goal is to shut it down. So Governor Phil Bryant, state of Mississippi, he is determined to make Mississippi the first state in the country to respect the sanctity of human life since Roe v. Wade. And here's a great story. Here's a mom who decided not to abort her disabled baby after she saw his smile in a 3D scan. Ultrasound is a powerful pro-life tool. As she had a severely disabled son. The doctors told her, look, you just go ahead and abort him because he's not going to be able to live because of how severely disabled she, he is. She was thinking about it until she saw him smile in a 3D ultrasound scan picture. Now, she was told her baby's brain had not formed properly. He'd never walk. He'd never talk. He would need 24-hour care. But after she saw him smiling, this is from the Daily Mail in the U.K., she saw him smiling, blowing bubbles, kicking and waving his arms. She made the decision to go through with the birth, and sure enough, he died nine hours after he was born. But she has absolutely no regrets that she went through with the birth as she was able to, to cuddle her baby son. She said, when I saw him smiling and playing inside me, I knew I couldn't end his life. If he could smile and play and feel, then despite his disabilities, he deserved to enjoy whatever life he had left, no matter how short. Just because his life would be shorter or different didn't mean he didn't deserve to uh, experience it. So, And she uh, doesn't regret it. She was able to cuddle him, hold him for the nine short hours uh, of his life, and it didn't face her at all that if he'd lived, she would have had to take care of him virtually 24 hours a day, happy to do it as a mom. Well, let's go back to the phones. Let's go to Joe, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Joe, you're on Focal Point with Brian Fisher. What's on your mind? Yeah, Brian, thank you for taking my call. Yeah, and bravo to that uh, wonderful woman who gave birth to that child. And Isn't that and, a great story? And, yes, yes, and now she can go through life knowing that her child's death was in the hands of God and that, that her, her, the blood of her child is not on her hands, thank you know, God. You know, when I was a pastor, I'll uh, tell the story very briefly, but when I was a pastor, I had a couple that uh, she was pregnant with twins. They had moved to another state. She was pregnant with twins. One of them had no brain stem. I mean, it, it was impossible for that child to survive after it was born. And the right. doctors were pressing her to abort the child, and she called me wanting counsel. And that was one of the toughest conversations I've ever had in my life because she was told, look, if you keep this child, it could endanger the life of your healthy unborn child. And it was difficult for me, but I said, look, you got to choose life here. The right thing to do is to give life to that 
child. God's entrusted you with that life, and I think you'll regret it for the rest of your life if you terminate that life prematurely. She made it was it was a lot of tears in that phone conversation, gut wrenching conversation to have, but she made the decision to give that child life. The child was born. They named it. The child died just a few hours after it was born, but they had a burial service for the child. The baby had a name. They had pictures. She was able to cuddle it, and she uh, called me later and thanked me for that counsel. She said, I will never, ever, ever regret having made the choice for life. Anyway, go ahead. What's on your mind? Of course. Right. Well, um, you said something really interesting uh, a little while ago, and if I, if I understand this correctly, there's a provision in Obamacare that says that uh, health care providers cannot uh, 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 ask whether a, a given household has weapons or ammo and so forth. Yeah, they're, they're strictly and, prohibited by Obama's own law from doing that. They, exactly. And, of course, he pressed night and day, Nancy Pelosi and the rest of them did, for this very law. And now, if I am not mistaken, he, want, he has issued or will, plans to issue an executive order that uh, uh, obviates that, uh, that very provision in Obamacare. Do, do I have that right? He, he plans it. By executive order, to yeah, take that off yeah, he, he's saying we need to clarify that Obamacare doesn't prevent healthcare professionals from asking questions about guns, and it does. I mean, it, 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 it so he so he's breaking the law. I mean, if he issues that executive order, he will be breaking his own law. It, yes, and, and by the way, does it follow legally speaking that if Obama is able to uh, rescind that provision of Obamacare, wouldn't that nullify all of Obamacare and take it off the table? In other words, maybe this is the way to kill Obamacare. Let, uh, let Obama uh, rescind that provision, and the whole law falls apart. Yeah. But, uh, but, but how scary is it to think that a president can take a given law enacted by Congress uh, and signed into law by that president and cut and paste and add and subtract yeah. provisions. That, that's what within dictators that, within do. That that's, what, that's what dictators yeah. do. They change the law on the fly. The law is whatever they decide it is on a given day, and that's the mindset of Barack Obama. Well, listen, I appreciate the call, Joe. That, yeah, that's a great call. And you know what I think is a more lethal threat to Obamacare is actually the fact that more than half of the states will not set up a state exchange. And this this is creating a crisis in Obamacare Sibelius today uh, extended the deadline for states to get on board. States don't want to have anything to do with these exchanges because they know it's going to be a budget killer for them in the years to come. And the law says, okay, if the state doesn't set it up, the federal government will set up a state exchange and the, and the federal government will run it. Well, there's no way they can get tooled up to do that. They've got to have these things ready to roll out October 1. There's not a chance in the world they're going to be able to do it. And secondly, Obamacare provides them no authority to provide subsidized insurance through a federally run exchange. They thought the states were going to love this thing. Every state in the union was going to sign up as fast as they could. They weren't even worried about the whole issue of subsidies. Now they're going to be responsible for insurance exchanges in more than half of the states, and they do not have the authority by law to offer subsidized insurance, even for poor people under Obamacare. Now they're going to find some way to get around that. They're going to find a way to try to break their own law but that could be the Achilles heel of Obamacare. Let's go to Moses in uh, Mansville, Ohio. Moses, you're on Focal Point with Brian Fisher. What's on your mind? Hi, Brian. Hey. I appreciate your, your <clears throat> excuse me. I appreciate your program. I, I listen to it uh, every time I have a chance. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, uh, on the, the teacher that I called in a little bit ago. Yes. Uh, she was talking about uh, psychiatrists. Um, a psychiatrist ha have their place, and uh, I understand there's people that are mentally um, ill. But if if psychiatrists just deal with their mind, they will just create a confusion in that person's uh, in in his mind. If if you don't lead somebody to Jesus, where they can have a change of heart, mm -hmm. um, it'll just create uh, confusion and. Yeah. all that so it won't deal with the core issue all right moses that's a great call and i appreciate that's exactly right it goes deeper than the mind it goes to the heart you know and there's another angle to this if you have if, if mental health professionals can take away people's guns then what are people going to do that need help from a mental health professional they're not going to go i mean you're going to make this problem worse because now people have mental illnesses they don't want to go get help because they may lose the capacity to defend themselves so they won't 
and so their problems may get worse because they're not treated. A couple of quick sound bites as we wrap up today. Let's go to Piers Morgan, number 10, Rob, if we can. Piers Morgan admits, Piers Morgan, Mr. Anti-Gun, he admits in this clip that an assault weapon ban, uh, I broke my own rule, that a ban on sporting rifles won't stop mass shootings. Let's listen. I mean, the reality, Bo, isn't it? This will not solve the gun crime problem in America. It's not going to stop mass shootings. What it is, it seems to me, is an imminently sensible reaction to the horrors of what happened in Sandy Hook and indeed in Aurora and the other seven mass shootings in 2012. <laughs> he says, look, it won't do any good. It won't work. It won't stop. But it just seems sensible to me. We ought to do it, whether it works or not. And quickly, Joe Biden. Uh, no, I don't have time for that, I don't think. I got Joe Biden, uh, just Mr. Gaftastic. Joe Biden saying that there is no silver bullet to stop mass shootings. That's Joe Biden. No silver bullet to stop mass shootings. And then he said in that same, uh, that, that same meeting, we are shooting to release these regulations uh, on uh, Wednesday. So that is uh, Joe Biden, gaff a minute, Joe. Uh, that's the only upside, the only upside to having four more years of this administration is we get four more years of the silver-tongued orator, Joe Biden. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. Do not forget to bow low before God, stand tall before man, stand in the gap, and never forget, with God's help, we are fighting a winnable war. See you back here tomorrow. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast do not necessarily reflect those of American families.